Hello, I'm Dawn Durham, and welcome to Patent Pod. Patent Pod and the entire patent system remains dedicated to providing professional development to educators and support for families and students. Today, we're excited to walk, welcome Dr. Paul Riccamini to help us understand this idea of maintenance practice and why it's critical in our mathematics classroom. Dr. Dr. Riccamini, welcome to Patent Pod. Glad to be here. Thank you very much. If you could just help our listeners understand just kind of briefly, what is maintenance practice and why is it critical that we have it included in our instructional design? So maintenance practice is sort of a, it's a practice mechanism that's designed to help kids remember or retain. I often refer to maintenance more along the lines of retention. And the reason why retention in mathematics is, is so vital is math, the content of math is such that it is a progression and it tends to build upon itself. So when students learn something, that will likely be the foundational blocks for the next information that they're going to learn. So, so it's critical. Now, maintenance is important in all subject areas, but it is particularly important in the area of mathematics due to the content. So when we think about that idea that, um, and Andrew said all subjects need maintenance practice, but particularly in mathematics, because you have a skills that build onto each other, um, understanding and really retaining those progression of skills is critical for the concept of becoming really mathematically literate and maintenance practice helps us with that. Now I wanna ask you, and we really strive, um, you know, within Patent Pod and across the entire patent system to encourage practitioners to use practices and um, methods and techniques that are grounded in science and evidence. Can you help us in understanding some instructional routines that are grounded in research and evidence for maintenance practice? So this is something that's very exciting because there has been a flurry of research um, in this area, specifically targeting retention and in the area of mathematics. So two strategies in particular that have come up and, and one, especially one interleaving practice format is a structure that is getting a lot of attention specifically in the area of mathematics because of the powerful boost that it is giving students uh, retention. The second routine is called practice test retrieval. Now this particular routine has been researched in a wide range of subject areas but it has a lot of applications in the area of mathematics. And again, the research is showing large boosts to retention. So I think those are the, those are the two primary areas or two primary strategies that I like to focus on. So when we think about that interleaving practice format, what does that look like in a classroom setting? I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, so that's a great question. So what we're talking about is literally how the problems are sequenced for the kids to practice. So there are, the other format is called blocked practice. So blocked practice is when they practice the same type of problem consecutively. I was a former middle school teacher, so we would teach order of operation. So blocked practice would be five problems in a row that all revolved around order of operation. Block practice serves the purpose of short, uh, initial learning or acquisition. So interleaving, what it would look like is you take three different types of problems and you put them in a, in a sequence where the kids practice them in a mixed structure. So problem one might be order of operations. Problem two might be find the area of this triangle. Problem three might be a word problem. So in that case, Interleaving means to mix it up, and that is what produces that boost to retention. Now, now, how does it look? What does it look like in the classroom? It could, it could be in any variety of structures as long as the kids are practicing in a mixed sequence. So you're talking about really ultimately a sequence versus this kind of blocked practice and this interleave, inner um, leaving practice format as opposed to kind of the same concept asked five, six, seven times in a row. Is there 
should we avoid locked practice? Or is there is there a time and a place for both? Yeah, so that's a great question. So as this research is evolving, what we're seeing is there is a time and a place for both. And this is where I really try to, to focus teachers on what is the purpose of your practice? Mm -hmm. So if the teacher says, well, they just learned this particular uh, skill or concept, so we need to practice it. In that situation, the practice should be blocked because it's initial learning. But if the teacher says, hey, I need to review this, or this is a cumulative review or a maintenance, or the word I like, prefer is retention, then that practice needs to be interleaved. So there's a time and a place for both, but it has to do with the purpose. Everything comes down to the purpose. What are we really looking to get out of our lesson? So if we're doing initial acquisition, skill learning, we're looking at that blocked practice, multiple attempts at one particular concept or skill or strategy, technique, whatever we're using. And then when we're looking to retain information, when we're looking to um, ensure maintenance of those skills and concepts, now we're looking at that interleave practice. Am I getting this correct? Absolutely, that's correct. Great, so now I wanna ask you about practice test retrieval. What does that what does that even look like in a classroom setting? So this is another strategy that is emerging. Uh, I shouldn't say really emerging. They've been around for a long time. We're just really sort of solidifying them into the classroom. So what practice test retrieval looks like in a classroom is the teacher would want to give the students an opportunity to free recall. So in other words, a teacher could pose the question, hey, we learned about the Pythagorean theorem two chapters ago. Let's take a minute and I want you to write down everything you can remember about the Pythagorean theorem. So that is the key element, free recall. Now, once the kids have an opportunity to recall, the next step would be that the teacher gives feedback. Now, the feedback can come from a variety of ways. It could be peer to peer. It could be they could look in their notebooks or it could be delivered by the teacher. But the key feature is that there's some feedback. The third element is students rate their own recall. So like self-regulation. So one, I didn't recall much of anything. Four, I recalled everything. So there's, we're, this is helping them regulate their learning. And then the last piece is it has to be low stakes. So in other words, it cannot be graded. So that's a really key piece here. What the research showed is if, it, if, if the kids think it's a high stakes, like some grade, you lose the boost to retention. But that's what that's a, a real quick example of how it would uh, you would use that in your classroom. So when we think about this free recall, you know, what do you remember? Kind of us brain dump, if you will. Tell me everything you can remember. Write it down, jot it down. We provide feedback and that feedback comes through peer to peer or through a notebook or the teacher's. Um, the students rate, you know, how well did I recall or oh, not so well over here, but we are ensuring that it's not graded. This is um, kind of getting an idea of what the students can and cannot retain. Am I, am I getting the sequence correct here? That you got it. That's exactly right. So is there ever, you know, should we ever have the students start by looking back in their notes or start by talking to a peer or is it always just this free recall right away? So great question very common come comes up when I work with teachers. So again, it goes back to what is the purpose? Mm -hmm. So if your purpose of looking in your notes is to teach kids how to look in their notes, something they just learned, then yeah, they would look in their notes first. But if your purpose is really about maintenance or retention, you would not want them to look in their notes first because then it is not free recall. And this is sort of an interesting um, kind of conflict because we want kids to look in their notes, but what we're, what we're finding is if that's done in a retention activity, it actually creates a sense of false confidence in the kids and that they think they, they recalled it. And the reality is they didn't, they looked it up and it doesn't help their retention. So understanding and having our students with that, especially that that rating, that self-rating is, could I do it on my own? Or did I need to kind of go back and look at my notes that I need to appear to prompt me? Did I need the teacher to give me a cue? Really determines if they've retained it, if they have maintenance, or if we have to go back to the acquisition and initial learning. 
Yeah, that's exactly correct. That that regulation is something we need to teach our kids so that they can monitor their own learning or if they don't understand something or don't remember it, they know they now know they have to get assistance. However that may take place. The monitoring of the own learning um, I think is a key piece here in understanding that. Now, let me ask you this, are there other aspects about maintenance practice that we need to consider, especially knowing that we have some different formats and different platforms in which we may be delivering instruction moving forward in the new academic school year? So I think one of the things, obviously everybody's grappling with the remote learning or the in-person learning or hybrid or, or whatever it ends up being. I do think that these strategies um, specifically will apply to any environment. I think these um, generalize quite easily, or maybe easily isn't the right term, but will translate to a remote environment, a live session, uh, or even a recorded session. I think I think these are will both offer offer teachers opportunities to you to be used in a Zoom setting or a live setting. And I think that's key, Dr. Rickamini, is that we're offering opportunities for generalizability because there, there may be some um, adjustments and changes as we start the academic year and even as we move through the academic year. So knowing that we have these practices that are grounded in science and are grounded in evidence um, to ins- assist with retention and maintenance of skills, particularly in mathematics, but I would think we could generalize this to any subject that we're working with. As you had said, math is just particularly um, specific to making sure that we maintain and retain those skills and concepts. Yeah, I, I think the practice test retrieval is uh, uh, an excellent strategy to go across content areas. And I also think the elements of IPF also will generalize into some other classes as well. So, so the big thing with these retention, what we're finding is the elements that boost the retention most likely can be applied in all subject areas. So it's applicable no matter what it is you're teaching in that classroom. That's correct. If your Which purpose is re- if your purpose is retention, then these are definitely options to use. Wonderful. I appreciate knowing that that we can kind of generalize it specific to mathematics, but then generalize it out as well. You know, what if I've got some viewers and listeners out there who are saying I need a little bit more understanding or more knowledge about maintenance practice? Where can we send them? So there's a great website called retrievalpractice.org. And on that website, it is devoted to practice, how to make practice more effective, and a big part of it is about retention. So these strategies in particular, as well as a few other ones that we didn't mention, there are many practice guides on there that are 13 to 15 pages that really dig into the elements of how the strategy works and how you would use it in the classroom. And I highly recommend that that you visit that website retrievalpractice.org. It's something maybe we should uh, get, jump right on, bookmark it, and get ready to go. At retrievalpractice.org. Thank you for sharing that resource. I appreciate it. Dr. Rickamini, thank you so much for joining Pat and Pod and for helping our listeners understand the importance of maintenance practice, but also some of the best um, methods and best, best evidence-aligned practices to go ahead and do that in the classroom, mathematics classroom specifically, but really any content area we teach. So thank you so much for joining Pat and Pod. We appreciate you. Thank you very much. Glad I could participate. Thank you to all of you in the field. You are an inspiration to your students, your families, and the rest of us. A special thank you to John Ragsdale for producing this podcast. We'll see you next time on Pat and Pod.